Hello and welcome to the LFC Day Trippers Women's Show. Uh, I'm your host, Chris Brack, and of course, I enjoy my, my podcasting friends, uh, Philippa Smallwood, Emma Sanders, and Neil Atkinson. How are we all doing? Excellent. Yeah, good, thank uh, you. Good, good, good. So, uh, I think since we last spoke, uh, we had seven games, two in the FA Cup, five in the league, so, you know, nothing like him coming thick and fast, is there, Philippa? No, exactly. Uh, it's probably the most uh, consistent run of games, I think, that we... That we've had for quite some time so uh plenty of games to watch and, and plenty to for us to go through today i think yeah so um emma i mean in terms of you know arsenal game aside it's been largely positive you know lots of goals lots of fun uh and then the, we had the, the big double header with charlton so it's been a an interesting right right have you found the uh the last seven yeah, I mean, obviously Liverpool were, were sort of winning games for fun and then, you know, they had some tough games, um, obviously, in, in the Cup, both against um, our Spurs in, in, in the Conti Cup and then obviously Arsenal um, in the FA Cup, sort of. I think both of them were were this side of the new year. Can't remember, the last three months have just absolutely flown by. So Spurs could have been in October for all I know, I can't remember. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, so they yeah, they were like sort of, you know, obviously picking up points, doing really well in the league. Um Drew with London City, um, Drew with Charlton. So sort of um, winning run kind of not as, um, you know, good as, as probably the last time we spoke on the pod, but they're still unbeaten, um, still top of the table. So, um, yeah, I think absolutely it's it's, it's looking good. All, all you can do is is avoid defeat and, you know, it's it's in Liverpool's hands. So as long as they, as they keep picking up points, um, they're almost over the line there. So... Yeah, I would have liked to have seen them beat Charlton, but Charlton are a good side. There's, there's no sort of you know denying that, and um, you know they, they they gave us two two tough games. So I think a, a win and a draw against them is is perfectly fine. Yeah, Neil. I mean, four points from Charlton, you know, is a really good return. But obviously, fans like me does you do get the twitchy feet because it is getting to the the business end of the season now. So you are sort of you know talk about the players, but certainly me. <laughs> Starting to feel the pressure now of uh, the title is getting ever ever closer. I mean, this is this very thing is you know it's it goes both ways. This the thing I will point out is that Bristol City lost both games against Charlton over the course of the season. I had a little look earlier today, and they they lost uh, both home and away to Charlton, Liverpool, in the end take four points from those games. But I think the nerves are understandable because Bristol have just gone on one five on the bounce, uh, you know, and say what you want, but there's a lot to be said for just winning five on the bounce. Uh, it, 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 it ratchets things up quite nicely. Uh, they lost one of those games to Charlton that I mentioned. They'd won the three league games that they had before then, uh, may even before, you know, they've, 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 they started really slowly, uh, Bristol. It's worth pointing out that in the first six, uh, I think it was, they lose three and they draw one. Um, so they only take two wins from those first six, and yet they find themselves now hot on Liverpool's heels, which suggests they've worked a few things out over the course of the season and they've put right what, what wasn't going so well for them last year. Uh, and it is, let's make no mistake about it, it's perfectly understandable to be twitchy, Chris. You know, I think that ultimately the two draws Liverpool have had recently, if one of them, just one, could have been a win, then there'd be no reason for any form of twitchiness. But as it is, I think the idea that this, you know, this is still not done. Um, and Liverpool have got to therefore get it done. You know, I think that the London City results in the Charlton, the London City away in the Charlton home game, they could just have done with one of them resulting in all three points because obviously they've still got to go to Bristol uh, in amongst all of this as well. It's a massive game against Durham this weekend. They've still got to go to Bristol. Bristol have got a game in hand. If they win that, it's only five points. And that, if Liverpool then don't get a result at Bristol, uh, then that opens up the idea that, you know, it's going to go all the way to the wire and, you know, Liverpool don't want it to go all the way to the wire, not least because they've got planning to do for next season and all that sort of stuff. I think it's I think it's got a little bit edgier. I think, though, that's ultimately down to the excellence of Bristol more than it is anything to do with Liverpool having got a great deal wrong, and I think it's important to remember that. Yeah, Neil's right, isn't he, Philip? I mean, we're talking, we've only, the only game we've lost is to in the league is the Lionesses' first game of the season. You know, so... You do. We do have to put that context in in, in there that you know this is, this is side that you know doesn't lose many games. To be fair, doesn't really concede a goal very often either. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it's 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 easy sometimes when you go through what you know we probably feel as fans is a little bit of a blip at the moment because out of the last three games, you know, we've dropped four points, um, but we've put ourselves in such a strong position that 
I think that kind of makes us more twitchy in a way because you feel like there's more for you to lose. If yeah. it was really mm. tight, you kind of, you know, you know you're in a dogfight, you know that, you know, every point is critical and you can kind of just get engrossed in the fight. Whereas now, because we've been so far ahead, it's almost like we've got everything to lose and Bristol have got everything to gain. So they're playing kind of almost with, you know, no weight of expectation on their shoulders because they were so far out of it. And we kind of, you know, have had that weight of expectation now that, that we are going to get promoted. Um, I, I do feel like sometimes it is coming across in the play. You know, we seem a little bit more hesitant and not not kind of playing um, some of the free-flowing football that we were a few games ago. Um, but I also think that that's partly down to the quality of the size that we've played. You know, the last three games, playing London City away, who's been one of the strongest sides in the league, and then Charlton back-to-back. Playing any side back-to-back is never easy. Um, but doing it against a team that is as strong as what Charlton are, and I, I fancy them to, you know, be really challenging next season. Um, I think it's, it's you know, those three ties are, you know, are very difficult. Um, on paper and I think that's what proved to be in all three of those games Um, and Liverpool have come out again undefeated from those three games and I think that is also very important you know although we feel we've had a little bit of a blip they're still undefeated um, in this run and you know I I just hope they've not lost uh, you know any confidence really because I think that you know still we're the strongest side in this league Um, and, you know, we just need to start showing it again. And, you know, first first things first is at Durham at the weekend. Yeah. I mean, Emma, the big positive we can take from this is, um, you know, Liverpool we've seen all season. They haven't gone through this season unscathed. You know, we played a back three yesterday without two of our regulars in the back three, which is Leanne Robe, who's, you may have argued, it's between her and Jazz, who's been the best defender uh, in the team. Uh, the, the captain's not there this week. Uh, we've had to, We've lost Kerry Holland for a little bit. Uh, Carla Humphrey, to a, to a credit, came in first start in God knows how long. Best player in the pitch. So mm-hmm. there are we have seen players that have come in that when we need them to, and you know step in when you know perhaps last year that was that was an issue we had, which is if we lost some of the first eleven, you know it was a, it was hard for us to still keep going, keep challenging. And I do think that's what they they've managed to do in a very difficult period. Yeah, absolutely. And look, every team goes through a period where they've got players missing. Liverpool actually had that period probably a month ago and almost came through it um, far too strongly in a way. Um, But I think the players who sort of stepped in and did their jobs then are probably feeling it a little bit now because of, you know, almost like that there's been a delayed kind of response to to those games. Um, You know, we've seen the likes of Fernie start, um, you know, quite a few games in in a short space of time. Um, Obviously, a player who we know um, there's been sort of, you know, managing the, this injury that, that she's sort of had ever since um, kind of last summer, really. So um, she's played a lot of football. Like you say, Carla's come in. I thought she was fantastic the other day. Uh, Liverpool's best player, in my opinion, on the pitch. Um, yes, we've been short of defenders in a way. Um, you know, Jazz Matthews has come in. Neve's been out now and again. You've had Meg Campbell, who's still not probably fully fit. Um, Taylor Hines has played a hell of a lot of football. Probably looks like it's catching up with her a little bit now. I think the last two or three games, she's not quite been at the level that she was arguably a month or two ago. Um, Kerry Holland has obviously struggled a bit since coming back from COVID. And yet, as Philippa says, Liverpool is still undefeated in this run. So I think that's that's a credit to the squad. And look, Matt Beard knows, he, he knows that at some point that tiredness was going to catch up with the players. Um, he knows he was going to need his squad depth and he knows that you're not going to go and win every single game. I agree with Neil, I think, if, if Liverpool had beaten either one of Charlton or, or London City from those two draws that they had, then it would have been a much easier sort of going into these these last four games of the season. But look, Liverpool wouldn't have expected to have won as many games, I don't think, as they would have done so far at this point, considering, you know, all those injuries and stuff that we sort of had back in January, February time. Um, you've got to think about the goalkeeping department issues that we kind of had before Christmas as well, where there was literally only really lousy that fit and she was basically... Um, pulling a groin every every minute of the game every time she kicked the ball. So, um, yeah, they've done well to get through it so far. And at some point, obviously, points were going to be dropped. Hopefully that's the end of it and they can um, bounce back and just get the job done. I think the next two games, Durham, and then obviously the big one against Bristol, I think if they win those two, then the title's done. Mathematically, not quite, 
But if, if they win those two, I, I can't see Bristol City getting it back. So, yeah, they're, they're still in a strong position. Yeah, so I mean... Neil, as Emma says, just win the next two and it's job done. You'd, it's you'd rather be you'd rather be us than Bristol by a mile, and Bristol would rather Bristol would rather be you know would rather be us than Bristol. This is this is where it is. This isn't you know, this is this is this is the moment that's in front of them. The the the, the, the Bristol thing is you know you have to look at what they've been doing. They've scored three or more in every single one of the last five games. That really suggests a side that's clicked and is playing with a bit of freedom. And I think that that's you know it's something to bear in mind. The other thing to point out, though, is that when we go there, Emma says, you know, just win the next two, arguably just win the next one and draw the one after. And then it's also, yeah. you know, about mm-hmm. as close to done as it can be. And I think that's that's also what gives Liverpool a lot of strength going into that Bristol game. You know, the, the uh, uh, from the minute it kicks off, the results suit to Liverpool. They, they may as well already be 1-0 up, and Bristol will have to approach it that way. Now, you can say that mm-hmm. that offers clarity for Bristol, but what it actually means is they're more likely to take a few risks and Liverpool can exploit the gaps that they have to leave at some point as the game wears on. So, no, for me, there's there's just... Uh, the, 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 the only sort of slight concern is, as Philip has said before, they just looked a little... just ever so slightly lacking in some fluency at the weekend. And little things like the dreadfulness of the officiating did not help them and didn't help matters. Because, you know, obviously when you're desperate to get all three points for a variety of reasons and there's this thing that keeps happening to you that's stopping that from happening, it's hard to sort of not feel as though there's external forces that, you know, that you you can't control that are are driving you a bit mad. I think there's also just a couple of opportunities where I think over the course of the season, uh, Liverpool's forwards have been really good at snap, taking opportunities at key moments. Didn't just just didn't drop for them uh, against Charlton, which I thought was quite was just a little bit of a shame. You know, the, the, at moments there was there was one tremendous save, absolutely tremendous mm. save from the Charlton goalkeeper. Uh, I think from Casey Stengel, which was just off the charts good. And it's a shame, isn't it? You know, it's a brilliant bit of football, but it's a, it's a bit of football that you wish you hadn't seen because ultimately, then Liverpool, I think they would have won the game. And I think I think the, the other thing that I do wonder about. It, which may have happened is that I think the first time round when people, when Liverpool play, uh, when Liverpool played some of these sides or earlier in the season, there was still an element of you can get at Liverpool. I think that now is just solely turned into you can possibly contain Liverpool. And it's yeah. now much more about the idea of containing us to an extent than it is about the idea of anything else. And that's a, a new challenge, but it's only going to be a relatively brief one, hopefully, because if promotion comes, then next season you've got to pr- prove yourself all over again from scratch. But, you know, I think that the, the the Charlton game, as I say, it is just a little bit frustrating that they didn't just find a way to to get the ball into the back of the net because then Chris, you especially, could sleep easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, less said about the officials, the better. I think Philip heard my bellow from the back of the stands of what I thought of one bit of officiating, which sadly, as always, when I shout, the whole crowd went quiet. So everyone, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was audible on the Liverpool TV. They had to bleep it. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but we'll say less about that. But the other big strength Liverpool have got, Neil, uh, I'll come back to you, is the manager. I mean, unlike me, who's twitching every two minutes, because that's the way I am at the moment. Um, Pokes match, he's very measured. He's very calm. He doesn't get too over the top when Liverpool have gone on these big runs and he yeah. doesn't get too low when it's a disappointing draw. It's just, it, he's very calm, very light. And to be honest, generally watching them makes me go, yeah, it's it's it, it's not that bad. It's annoying, I, but it's not that bad. I think that the key part of it is that when there was when it was time, when it was not time, but when it was possible to get carried away, he didn't get carried away. And I think mm. that that therefore means that there's, you know, now he's not changing his tone. Uh, and I think there's still, and I think that the, the 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 whole vibe that comes off the whole squad and has come off the whole squad over the course of the season is that there's a, a job of work that needs to be done, which is putting Liverpool back into the WSL, which is where Liverpool should be. And the manager's been centre to that in terms of his his tone and his, you know, all the way through. This is, it's almost, you know, it's almost as though this is the thing we have to do before we do the next thing, which is the thing I'm almost more interested in, in a way, you know. And that's not to, yeah. not, not, not. It's, it's like I've come here and there's, there's stages to this work, and this is just stage one. So if you think I'm going to go mad when stage one's going well, you've got no idea because I want to do stage two, stage three, and stage four of all of this. And I think that that's come through, and I think that that. I think that that's there as well in the, the sort of the more senior members of the squad. You know, they see themselves as being part of a process which is primarily to return to Liverpool to where they should be within this this, this, this hierarchy. And so I think that that, that helps and it, it makes you think that cool heads will prevail because these are cool heads. So I think all of that bodes well for what comes next. And, you know, genuinely we sit here now and I'm, I've talked Bristol up. It wouldn't surprise me if Liverpool get a result against Durham next weekend and they go to Bristol with the same sort of attitude that they had when they went to Durham earlier in the season. And they turn up mm. and they just 
crystal clear that the game belongs to them from minute one and there's there's little you can do about it. That really would not surprise me if that's what that, that they're almost now targeting that game, the way in which the first half of the season, they clearly mentally as a group manager to every single player targeted Durham away. It wouldn't surprise me if that happens again. I absolutely can't wait for this Fernie tackle in like the first 30 seconds where she just that was, straight in. That that was like a goal out in the away game. Yeah. Especially, when she bounced, especially as she bounced up straight away and just looked and said, is that my free? That was the best <laughs> line. That was the best line. She, she said, sure, that's my free kick. She just put the girl six foot in the air. It was brilliant. But, uh, Philippa, I mean, I think this Durham game, well, it's big in the context of the season. It's also big in the context of how far Liverpool have come because Durham at home, first game last year, I think was players definitely for fans, a culture shock of wow, this is this is different level. This is not what this is not what we're used to. And I think I think Liverpool have adapted to that really well. Uh second half of last season, but especially this season, I think this is where we're gonna see, you know, can you go again at you've got to out battle these, you've got to outfight them and then let your quality shine through. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think Durham are the sort of side that kind of epitomise the championship for me. Um, you know, it's it's not necessarily about how good your players are. It's about how much they want it. Um, and I think, you know, Durham are the sort of side that, you know, they, they turn up and they try and show that they want it more than what you do. Um, and like Neil just said there, when we went to Durham earlier on in the season, I think that was the, the game where I thought, yeah, we're going to do this because we literally turned up there and we thought, no, we're not we're not going to allow you to dominate this game. We're not going to allow you to to impose your game style on us. Um, you know, we're we're up for this fight as much as you are. And, you know, we we pretty much showed that we'd learned so much from last season. And I think mm. I think this is what's pleased me so much about this season really is the fact that, you know, last season there was far too many games where I felt we were out for and we didn't really understand what the championship was about. Um, but what they've done this season has shown me that actually they did learn an awful lot from last season. Um, they've got a manager who who basically knows, you know, what's needed game in, game out. Um, you know, we, like you said before, he doesn't get too flustered. Um, and I, I fully expect that on Sunday, the players will know exactly what they want to do. Um, they'll, they'll go in exactly the same attitude as what they had at Durham. And they'll want to show Durham that, you know, they're the number one side in this league. And I'm, I'm excited for this game. And I think this game is kind of like the, it's almost like the starter for the main course at, at Bristol, isn't it? And I think, you know, when you when you look at these two games, you know, the the, the critical ones really, because if we, if we do drop points against Durham, I think that, that gives Bristol I'm, I'm a bit a, of an I'm edge. Having lie, I'm having a lie down if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not what we want, is it? So I think I think we need as many people there on Sunday as possible. You know, there's no men's football. There's everybody can get down there. You know, there's there's plenty of entertainment on before the game. I think as well this weekend, the club are yeah, really yeah. obviously focused on this game and how important it is. Um, and I just want everybody to get down there and get behind the team. You know, the, the noisier we can be, the more that we can get behind the side, the easier it's going to be for them. Um, and I want to make it as easy as possible for the players. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't Go know. Go ahead, Philippa. I don't know what's going on. Don't away. You or Matt Beer, that the official, that poor that 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 official didn't know where to stand. Uh, oh, sorry. honestly. I think uh, it was I mean, when. Uh, she wasn't blowing up for like head injuries, and I was just. And it was one of the. It was one of their oh. as well. That was. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. But yeah, I think entertainment wise, um, there's a question and answer section. Is that about eleven o'clock with I believe it's Farrah Williams and John Barnes? So yeah, you know that, and I think the fan park was from ten a.m. So it's good yep. two hours for for families to come down and enjoy themselves before before the main course of watching us beat Durham, hopefully. So yeah. Uh, the other there's a free positive... coach. As, sorry, sorry, Chris. Well, there is a free coach as well from Anfield for anybody who you know struggles to get across the water or whatever. Um, you know the the club have been really good with that this season, where yeah. you know fans can go and park at Anfield and then get the coach over to to Prenton Park. So something else to take advantage of and taking all the the pre game entertainment. I would say. Yeah, I mean, Emma. The other big positive we've seen probably since we last spoke is. Uh, the progression for Riley Foster. Uh, she's now had the uh, the halo removed. She's uh, she's I mean yep. she's still in the hard college. Still got a, 
a long way to go. But it was uh, it was love to see her. Uh, she was doing commentary in the game, and you know we all got to say hello to her after the game, which is it's just nice to see because um, forget the player side of it. You know, on a human perspective, it's really nice to see that she's making positive progress, and you know that that injury is is healing, albeit slowly, but it is healing. Yeah, absolutely amazing news. Obviously, I spoke to Riley um, a few weeks ago, did a piece um, on her injury on the website and, um, yeah, sort of been following her progress over the last um, couple of months ever since, really. And, yeah, no, just fantastic to see her um, sort of on the mend. And I know that she was really looking forward to being down at the game on the weekend. And, uh, yeah, I was listening to the commentary because I I was watching the game at home. Um, It wasn't meant to be. I was meant to be working and watching lots of other games. Um, <laughs> but I very much had that one on my TV listening to Riley, um, and she, yeah, I thought she was amazing. She, she might have a, she might have a job afterwards, but I think we need to be, a, be a bit careful because her, uh, her analysis as a co-coms was bloody brilliant. But um, yeah, no, fantastic to see her doing well, and um, obviously the next steps I think are going to be um, probably a tougher process in a way because she's almost yeah. kind of just been playing the waiting game. I know she said this to me in that interview that. Um, you know, she's going to just want to rush back and sort of do everything, but she has to keep pa- keep patient. And now that the halo is off, she's got a, an improved quality of life. And now mm. it's just about sort of seeing how how far she can push her body without actually pushing it. Um, and hopefully one day we might see her back from the football pitch. But yeah, I think everyone just is just really happy to see her sort of back out there looking more like herself and, and, in, and in enjoying herself and being at the football. So best wishes to Riley and yeah, great to see her. Mm-hmm. So, um, stick with you there. We, uh, in that Neil mentioned, you know, this is like stage one, so we're hopeful next next year. Stage two is we're in the WSL. So we've played two WSL sides in the cups. Uh, had a narrow one nil defeat to Tottenham pre New Year. Um, and then we had a you know a four nil uh, beating to Arsenal, where Liverpool had mm-hmm. had opportunities to stretch Arsenal, especially on the break. But Arsenal are top of WSL for a reason you, and you kind of saw their class in terms of the squad how do we feel it might evolve you know if it, it felt for me from a, a look at point of view maybe 3-4-3 three, three isn't quite the way to play in the WSL it felt, felt like we got a bit stretched in the middle we have tinkered Mahaz tinkered with just playing a two up top and filling the midfield a little bit more which seemed to give us a bit more control in some, some bigger games but from outside looking in, what what do you sort of think might be the next stage evolution for us? I think the first thing about the Arsenal game is it's worth pointing out that Arsenal's second and third goals were one in a million mm. efforts. And I think it's a really yeah. important bit to dwell on that. Liverpool, it, I mean, it, it absolutely cut the legs out of everyone on the pitch, in the stands, the two of them. It didn't feel the same way between one and two as it does between two and three. And then, you know, and then the third goes in and, and everyone knows, but not least because of the quality of Arsenal, you know, you're not coming back around. But if you haven't seen the strikes, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen the strikes, they are absolutely outrageous. Both of them are absolutely well, unstoppable. There's nothing that can be done about them at all. Um, and the, you know, the genuine sort of ball bobbling out 25 yarders. Um, and even then, I've seen, you know, I've seen many more sensible 25 yarders go into the back of the net than these outrageous efforts uh, from Arsenal. And it's not like Arsenal are doing that every week. You know, it's not like that's the, that's the reality of football in the WSL. It just isn't. So I think it's worth not being too downhearted in that regard. I agree with you, Chris, on the shape in that I think that ultimately one of the things that Liverpool have in this division is they have the idea that they're full-time and some of the teams they play aren't. They also, I think, have the idea that they've just got, in, in comparison to the players that they're meeting week in, week out in the Championship, I think they've got markedly fitter players. So it's been able to make the blanket stretch a little bit more. You're back Taylor Hines to look after the flank. You're back Kerry Holland in the middle of the park to be able to cover the ground of, in comparison to the Women's Championship, one and a half to two of their players. You know, you, you, you feel as though that's the case. Those advantages that they've, they've got will be very quickly eroded week in, week out in the WSL. And that's where, you know, I think there are going to be a couple of quite big decisions to be made. Not not about sort of players as, you know, whether or not they can contribute, but whether or not they all can. And that's the job for Matt Beard, I think. I, you know, I don't think this is an idea here where Liverpool are effectively shipping out 17 of the squad because none of them are anywhere near good enough and starting again from scratch and I'd hope that that wasn't the case but the flip side is there's going to have to be a little bit of rebuilding around another three or four where there's a certainty that they can produce in the WSL 
in a week in week out basis. So it's not for me about sort of net, you know, there's lots of re- factors that may go into that and the opaque nature of women's football on contract length and the amount that people get paid and values around transfers. All of that, I think, plays a part to this conversation that we just literally have no not even sort of knowledge of, but even contextual knowledge of, uh, with the possible exception at times of Emma. And Emma has to do her job brilliantly well to find anything out about bits and pieces that go on. And it's worth remembering that, that, you know, it's, it, it isn't this, it just is not the same sort of almost notion in your own head of a mental spreadsheet that you've got, that you've got around, you're able to have around men's football because of the way women's football just holds all these cards so close to its chest at all times. So there may well be one or two departures that could, for instance, you know, if we were to rank the players from one to 15, we might be mildly surprised by, but there might be some context in amongst them that, as I say, we're simply not privy to um, and go from there. But I think the one thing I do think is that, you know, if it's me, you go through the spine of the pitch and that's where I'd always build anything from. And I think that's something that Liverpool might just sort of need to do. Another excellent centre midfielder, another excellent centre forward, another excellent central defender. And I think that the one name that I think is separate to all of this is Rachel Laws, where I'd be amazed and astounded and genuinely disappointed if Liverpool didn't you know, back Rachel to the absolute hilt going back into the WSL next year. But even the players of whom, you know, over the course of this year, I've really admired and thought are excellent footballers. If one or two of them left, you know, or were knocked quite substantially down the pecking order, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be hugely surprised because precisely what this thing is going to be next, I think is markedly different. The other thing is it's worth remembering, it took them a couple of years now to get used to the championship and where the championship is, and there's going to have to be another reclimatization in terms of going back to the WSL. So I just don't think it's, you know, I think it's important to, to remember there is a very specific job that needs to be done and, and that there's a lot of ins and outs to that job as, as Emma keeps nodding along to. Mm. I mean, Emma, so off the pitch now, uh, obviously we followed the women's team for, for a while now. This seems to be the most stable we've seen off the pitch for quite some time, which does mm-hmm. give you the, the belief that if we go up, when we go up, um, it will get right this time because it was only five years ago where you, you looked at the squad that we had which was probably underperforming in WSL and 80% of that squad are now playing for Arsenal, City, Man United, Chelsea. So you can yeah. new- So Liverpool basically probably fell asleep at the wheel with actually a good squad. Um, I don't feel like that's going to happen this time. Now, that could be wishful thinking, but it doesn't feel to me that's that's the way that's the way it is now. It feels like it's a bit more of a vision. There is there is a plan for where they want to be, how they want to get there. Yeah, I agreed with a hell of a lot of what what Neil said there in terms of you know the players who um, have sort of shown shown their cards this season. But also, I think the culture of the club has actually been developed. I think the last couple of years, there, you know, if you were asked to describe what Liverpool Football Club was in terms of the women's team, um, I think I would have struggled a little bit because there was quite a lack of identity, quite a lack of sort of culture and kind of what the club was. I think now you go to games and you you know you speak to players, you speak to Matt Beard, you speak to everyone, and everyone's on the same page. And there actually does feel like there is a bit of a culture now, um, and I think that's really really important. And I think that provides the absolute basis of what you need going up into the WSL. And then obviously you've then got this core of players who um, have developed. Some have developed, um, as Neil said, in a kind of the championship way. But then there's been clear signings. The likes of Carla Humphrey came in last summer. Um, like as far as I'm aware, that was that's that's quite clearly a kind of a long term. That was almost like a stage two signing, um, with the hope that you know she could contribute in stage stage one, which she's shown in parts of the season that she's been able to do. But I I think she will play a more major role for Liverpool next season in the WSL than than she has done this season, which might seem quite odd because you know she's almost struggled to get in this season. But I think you know she's the type of signing, the type of player that Liverpool kind of eyed off as, as a player who would be one that would kind of step in in that stage two process because the football suits are better, the style suits are better in the WSL. She's shown that. Um, and I think still she, technically she's quite clearly one of Liverpool's most gifted players. Um, you know, the likes of Katie Stengel, who was brought in January, you know, some people raised their eyebrows and thought, you know, we've got the top goal scorer in the league. Why are we almost going out and making a marquee signing in January for a striker from America? That's because they were looking at stage two. 
and Katie Stengel, her quality is arguably a more suited to the WSL than perhaps Leanne Kearnes. That's not to say that Leanne can't play alongside her. I think they they will. Um, but Katie, I think, is definitely more suited to the WSL. So it's those kind of things, really. You know, in terms of like the player contracts, again, that was another really interesting point from Neil. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of players who I think might raise an eyebrow. I think they need to get Lawsy signed up ASAP. Um, the Robe is another one who I think it's contracts coming to an end. So it'd be interesting to see what happens there because at the moment, I think Liverpool are pretty, you know, perhaps top heavy in, in the defensive area. And they're probably going to have to get rid of one of the centre backs um, purely because of the fact that they need to add quality in other areas. They're overloaded in, in the centre back position, defensive position, which is probably one of the reasons why um, Beardy is kind of used, used that this season and played with three at the back because. You know, it's five at the back off the ball. So if you've got a load of defenders that are very, very good, then put them all on the pitch. <laughs> um, so when you're looking at recruitment for next season and, you know, areas that you want to strengthen, you probably might have to lose one or two in defence. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, what players sort of uh, <laughs> potentially leave. I think Nifahi's in a similar position in terms of her contract. And she might be another one that might be in discussions. Um, Rachel Furness, I think, has, has another year left. But obviously she's wanting to play in the Euros with Northern Ireland and who knows off the back of that what, what her body can do. So, um, yeah, it's, it's I think there's a lot of interesting conversations around big players at Liverpool. Um, I think all of them absolutely deserve um, an opportunity to stay in the W Town, at least have an opportunity to have that conversation. But as Neil says, you can't, you can't keep all of them if you want to progress to that stage too. So um, I think there will be movements and it'll be interesting to see what kind of movements those are. And I think it might tell us a little bit perhaps how Beardy might want to set up in terms of the formation, in terms of the style of play, depending on players that he brings in, players that perhaps leave the club. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, if Leanne Robe does, does leave the club, um, I think a little person will be coming to have a chat with you because um, <laughs> uh, that's uh, who my daughter idolises. So I, 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 don't, I don't have to break that news to her, to be honest. I'll, so. I'll give her a massive <laughs> hug with, with, with little <laughs> Mighty Red. We'll have a little sit down. I'll take her to the clipper. It'll be sound. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll hold you to that. I'll hold you to that. But yeah, I mean, as Emma mentioned, though, but, you know, Katie Stendhal is, is like phase two. Uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to chat to her earlier in the week. Um, great character on the pitch. A very interesting journey. Uh, somebody who decided to opt out of doing the American draft system because she wasn't happy because the way her last year at uni went and took the opportunity to, I'm going to go try myself in Germany, which is a hell of a, just a, I'm going to go go and try it. And then made sure she could play in Australia, made sure she could play in Norway in, in the off-season in America. So quite a character. She does seem to fit in. Uh, I've discovered Mushy Peas is a definitely a no-no, but Primark and Home and Bargains are okay. So I've, I've kind of, <laughs> so I've kind of got my Liverpool what she likes in Liverpool, what she doesn't like. Uh, but she settled in really well and she has took the pressure off Leanne Keenan because it did feel, while Leanne was scoring goals, it was great. You know, there was always that expected, well, if Leanne doesn't score, you know, where are we going to get some more goals from? So it does take that pressure off, which I think you do need in a squad is, you know, other options. Yeah, I think I think the problem that we had is obviously Rihanna Dean's been out mm. injured for pretty much the whole of the season and so there wasn't really that competition. There wasn't anybody to take that weight of of pressure away from Leanne. Um, and to be honest, we probably haven't had enough players chipping in with enough goals um, from midfield either, um, which, you know, is something that can be improved upon. I, I think, you know, going forward, it's it's not that they haven't got the ability there. It's just sometimes they don't maybe don't back themselves quite enough. Um, I think she's settled in really well. I really like her as a player. Um, but if I'm to be brutally honest, I feel like we've kind of lost a little bit of balance. Um, and that could purely be down to players not being quite used to one another as yet, um, you know, trying to find the feet. You know, what does Katie like? How does she like to play? Um, you know, her and Leanne, for me, haven't quite worked together as, as well as I would have liked. Um, but again, it's very early days. You know, we're talking what, five or six games into into that partnership and it's it's something that you know we we need more options for next season and I think that's certainly what what we were looking towards um with Katie um it does very much feel like it was a signing that we wouldn't be getting if it wasn't that we were confident of being promoted this season mm. um 
you know, and it, it's obvious to me that it is a signing for the WSL, um, you know, to, to, to get us those goals next season. Um, you know, and a, a, apart from that, you know, I'm, I'm one of these, I'm a bit of a stickler. I, I don't want us to make wholesale changes in the summer. Um, you know, we've seen what's happened with other sides when they've been promoted and they've made quite an, a number of changes and then they've struggled to kind of like find, you know, their way of playing in a way because the, the players just aren't used to playing together. Um, you know, we know that these players will fight for one another and that they know how to play together. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a really good um, feel about this squad. And I, I wouldn't want to see a lot of them leave. Um, you know, there's the odd one that you feel maybe isn't getting enough game time and you can see them, you know, wanting to, to move on to pastures new and that's all all fine. Um, but I think a lot of like those that are starting this season, I still want to be in and around that squad next season as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what Matt does, um, what direction he takes and what his plans are. Um, because let's not forget, he, he inherited a squad that, you know, when it boils down to it, he probably wouldn't have, have kept some of those players. Um, so maybe he's changed his mind having worked work with them for 12 months but it is going to be really really interesting to see what he does in the summer it is it is but getting back to the task in hand then philippa the running four games for us five games for them so for people who don't know our running is durham at the weekend which uh let's be honest durham is always a tough battle the big one bristol away and then if needed sheffield united at home with quite a few ex regs in there and then a long away trip to Lewis away, which hopefully we're going there as champions. Don't really want to be traveling all the way to Lewis needing the win if I can help it. I don't uh, want to go then... the dripping pan. <laughs> I also, <laughs> there's also no chance I'm getting that evening enough work, whereas, whereas there's a chance I could get drunk after work for Sheffield United. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so we've definitely got to get it right now for Sheffield United. Uh, and then in terms of Bristol, so they've got a tricky tie. Uh, away to Sheffield United this weekend, who are a funny side who uh, got turned over by Sunderland, uh, who are near the bottom, but then did really well and beat uh, London City Lionesses. So they're a side that on their day, as we've seen in the past, can cause problems. They've got, then got us. They then had the rearranged game with Coventry, who are currently on the uh, bottom of the league with minus one point. And then Lionesses at home, and then they've got Sunderland away. So on paper, they've probably got slightly needs run based on the form of the teams but i think as uh em's already said philippa is i think next two are crucial i think next two defines where where we finish yeah absolutely i think i think as well um you know what starts coming into this is that bristol have to win all their games mm. um to even stand a chance so in all of those games they're gonna have to attack teams they can't you know afford to kind of feel the way through games which is something that we possibly can do i mean i don't like it when we do that but you know we can we can kind of like make sure we don't get beat and try and win if you know what i mean whereas bristol can't really afford to do that um and the game against us i i genuinely feel like it'll come down to that game you know whoever wins that whether it's us whether it's bristol that to me could define who actually wins the league um <laughs> It, and it's like Neil said earlier, you know, Bristol have to win that. They can't afford for us to take anything out of that game for them to have any sort of chance whatsoever. And I feel like we've got more than enough quality then to be able to take advantage of any spaces that they leave um, for us to exploit. Um, I know they've been scoring quite a lot of goals recently, but their defence isn't anywhere near as good as what ours is. Um, and obviously we've got Rachel Laws at the back as well. So it's 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 going to be interesting but for me these next two are absolutely crucial yeah i mean look the uh, the bristol game is, is starting to feel like the build to christmas at the moment so it's an it's an away game i can't wait for but and like like philip said with laws you've always got it that always gives you an opportunity because is it five goals in the league she's conceded all year one goal in the league since since the turn of the new year she just doesn't she just doesn't like to see goals and she'll certainly tell you about it if she does 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we I had to get Neil to to triple check the count of clean sheets because she's kept that many in the league. And actually, the first time time he counted, he got them wrong, didn't you, Neil? So yeah, uh, yeah that oh, not to, not to, that not many. Not to throw under the bus or anything. <laughs> <It's all right>. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but but we but we came to it twelve that many clean sheets, which is uh, absolutely astonishing. So no, she's um yeah incredible at the back, and and the fact that. Uh, Liverpool know that any team playing against them has got to try really bloody hard to score a goal um, is a massive confidence boost. But yeah, I mean, look, looking at the run-in for me, I mean, I know you said that uh, Bristol's was slightly better. I, I'd argue it's actually quite a lot better. I think we've definitely got a tough run-in. Don't, 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 um, don't add to me nerves. Don't add to me nerves. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I still think, like I say, I still think Liverpool will be absolutely fine. Neil, Neil made a really good point earlier about the fact that, you know, Liverpool don't have to win that game against Bristol. I mean, hmm. I... I think if they win the, the next two at Durham and Bristol, then I just think mentally Bristol, it's 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 gone, it's done, and you know it's it's I mean it's all but done there anyway. Um, I think a draw with Bristol um, in terms of you know the actual mathematics of it and the table probably does as much damage, but perhaps the fact that Bristol you know getting a draw it might just give them a bit of a kick and Liverpool might you know might have a bit of a slump, but um, that's that's the only reason why I think just just get the two wins and, and the job's done. Um, but yeah, I think I, personally, I can't see Bristol dropping any any more points other than obviously against potentially Liverpool. Um, so I think if, if Liverpool just go out and win, look, if Liverpool win three of the next four games, then, then they've won the league. So yeah, I think the, the the other thing to sort of say on this is that you know, strangely, from a Liverpool point of view, you know, if they're going to take four points from the next two, it's better that they they, they draw the home game and then go and beat Bristol. You know, mm. this is the, that, yeah. that's now what that game is and how it operates. But if they do win the next one, then a point, I think, against Bristol is absolutely, absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, and it just sets up what is to come. And I, and I think that, you know, then you've got the room for, for Bristol error as well on your side a little bit more. Um, and that that's possible. Obviously, the ideal is to just go and win the next two. Mm-hmm. So if they win the next two, it is. I think you know it's it, the the mathematics of it. You know, Liverpool are, mm-hmm. are on forty nine. Um, you know, they Bristol the, the most Bristol can get is is fifteen more points from five more games. But if Liverpool have beaten Bristol, then the most that Bristol Start can seven. get is is forty seven. So if Liverpool win the next two, the champions. You, it's, you know, that's the that's that's the maths of it. They don't need to get to fifty one. Um, they just need to they just need to win the next two. Um, and then from there, you know, the the, the most Bristol can then get forty nine. Uh, if they if they hold them to a point uh, on that one, and Liverpool can 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 romp past that, but for me that that's the the straightforward thing is that it, I think it is you know it is um, Liverpool you know would then be on forty nine, and as I say, the most Bristol can get to forty seven, and that would that would just be it would be a, a great way to do it, and I think it'd be the fitting way to do it now as well. You know, I think I think if they can win the next one and then get themselves keyed up to go and show what they've shown over the course of the campaign at Bristol, that they will just yeah. deal with what's in their path. You know, I think I think they, they don't want to have to go and get something from the last, either the second to last game or the last game. I think the idea of, of having it done is is sort of the, the, the meaning that they've had since that game against Durham. But I would actually now argue in hindsight, in the run up to that game against Durham, they were, they were adopting that demeanor of we will do whatever it takes to sort this out. So I think I think it'd be perfect if they were to win the next two, and then it's all done. It's all done. Coming back from Bristol, they would be they'd be up and they'd be up as champions if they, if that happens. Awesome, awesome. Right, so before I let you go, then, Philippa, what game are they going to do it in? Bristol, Bristol away. I, I honestly, I, I feel like we're just going to win these next two games, get it over and done with, and then just have a nice big party against Sheffield United. Okay, okay, Emma. Yeah, hundred percent. Winning the next two, I just, I just can't see anything other than than them winning it at Bristol. Okay. Neil, full house. I am a full house. I think though the next two will be even by Liverpool standards at times this season remarkably attritional, uh, and I think that that will be, you know, I think they will go into Bristol and it'll be remarkably attritional. I really do, and I think that you know it wouldn't surprise me. If Bristol still nil nil on seventy. Uh, and Liverpool just just find a way to 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 force the issue late in the game and and, and give everyone who's who's travelled down a fantastic time. Excellent. That's what just what I'll need that for the away trips. That'll, that'll be me on the floor with a ventilator later then. So, <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, um, I've got a sneaky feeling Sheffield United are going to do us a favour. 
uh, next week. I don't know why they shouldn't they shouldn't do with the form they're in at times, but I've just got a sneaky feeling Sheffield are going to do us a favour, which is going to make the, the Bristol game even more fun. Yeah, <laughs> come on. I'll take that. Yeah. <laughs> but until then, listen, uh, thanks again to Neil, Emma and Philippa for joining us. So we'll be back probably, guys, in about four weeks when, fingers crossed, we'll all be talking about how great it is to be in the WSL. We can all talk about how, how great this season was. Until then, take care. Speak to you soon. Thank you.